I want to talk about the end of a great republic, the collapse of a great republic, the death of a great republic. And I'm not talking about the American Republic, at least not yet. I want to talk about the Roman Republic. I posted a video the other day here about how little Americans know about their own history. And they know even less about the rest of the world and, God forbid, ancient history. I asked in class one time what people knew about Julius Caesar. And they thought he was the guy that either invented or the Caesar salad was named after him. And of course, Caesar and Caesar salad is actually a Mexican chef. But they didn't know anything. Now, there are people who know something about uh, the fall of the Roman Republic. I mean, I'm not talking about the specialists. I mean, there's some general, you know, vision of what happened, version of what happened. And that's basically runs like this. The Roman Republic was trucking along. It was just doing, a, you know, it was doing fine. It was expanding. And along came this power hungry guy named Julius Caesar. He crossed some river, threw some dice on the ground, and that was it. Next thing you know, he's dead. And there's a, a emperors in charge. Uh, Roddy McDowell is in charge, and he's the first emperor, and his name's Augustus. But anybody who knows anything about the fall of the Roman Empire knows that it was far more complicated than that. And it's in those complications that I think lie the lessons that we can glean from what happened to the Romans. And stick with me to the end of this video, because that's where I'll get to those. But first, I need to outline what happened. Julius Caesar was born in our calendar, 100 BC. The Romans had their own calendar, which accounted from the founding of the city of Rome. So I forget what year it was in their calendar, but 100 BC. He crossed the Rubicon in 49 BC. So he was basically 51. During those 51 years, Caesar had witnessed, had lived through uh, five civil wars, a major uh, slave insurrection, Spartacus, you know, Kirk Douglas, and a major attempted coup, the Catalan conspiracy. This is all in those 51 years. It's actually less than 51 because it, it's the trouble started when he was nine years old. So basically, in the first 42 years of Caesar's life, there had been five civil wars, the Servile Revolt, and this coup. And he had, he had gotten through it all. He had participated in some of it. He played a, uh, a big role in the crushing of the Spartacus Revolt. He was on the outs when Sulla... Who was the uh, who established himself twice after the civil wars as dictator uh, seized power. Sulla's enemy was Marius, who was Julius Caesar's uncle, his his mother's brother. And at the end of a second time when Sulla was dictator, not only was Sulla trying to put the republic back on a solid footing, he was getting rid of people. He may have gotten rid of about ten thousand people, and Julius Caesar was on the list to be executed. After all these troubles, balance was reestablished in the Republic, but it wasn't based on a balanced political structure. It was based on balance between three major figures, what they called the first triumvirate. You had Pompey, Pompey Magnus or Pompey the Butcher, depending on whether you were with him or against him. You had Crassus, the richest man in Rome. And these guys were both from the Sulla faction of a party, sometimes called the Optimates. Caesar was from a different faction. He was from the old Marian faction, uh, his, his uncle's faction, but generally known as the Popularis. They were much more, wanted to share more power with the, the, the tribunate and the other functioning elements of the Roman Republic than the Optimates who wanted to keep most of the control of the Senate, although it's a lot more complex than that. Caesar was the poorest of the three. Actually, he had to be bailed out by Crassus. He was so deeply in debt. But he established relationships with the two, so he had this balance. He was pretty good terms with Crassus. He'd been Crassus's major lieutenant when they were they crushed Spartacus. Uh, and he was he had married Sulla's granddaughter, which gave him ties to that faction, and he had married his own daughter off to Pompey. So you had these relationships and you had some sort of balance. That was a situation when Caesar went off to Gaul with the new command there. That's how he got the command because he had this relationship with these other guys. But while he was in Gaul, 
that relationship crumbled. It crumbled for a lot of reasons. The Republic itself was not stable. Basically, you would have this Trump, it was like a three-legged stool, which is a relatively stable stool, even with three legs. The problem was, while Caesar was in Gaul, he was getting richer and more powerful and more popular, especially with the middle and lower classes, because he was sending back you know, Caesar's Gallic Wars for everybody to read. But the other problem that happened was Crassus went off to the east to get even richer and conquer Parthia, and he was defeated. It's actually killed along with his son. So Crassus is suddenly gone. So you go from having a three-legged stool to a two-legged stool, which requires a lot of balance. And the problem was Pompey grew increasingly distrustful of Caesar because the relationship, the balance of power, especially not just political, but uh, in terms of wealth, was starting to switch toward Caesar's favor. So the old Sulla faction, the Optimates in the Senate, were afraid of Caesar. And what they decided to do when the campaign ended, after he was up there for eight years in Gaul, very successful, obviously, although he had some tough moments, is they ordered him back, which meant he had to leave his legions behind and then return to Rome. Now, you have to understand Caesar's perspective on all this. He knew, he had seen it happen before, that they could get him. I mean, every Roman in any position of power was accumulating wealth and doing it through means that weren't quite above board. They were all corrupt, basically. The problem wasn't just corruption. The problem was if you were on the out power-wise, they would investigate you and take your property, banish you, or kill you. So Caesar knows that when he comes back, he's going to be vulnerable. Remember, Caesar had been on the list to be executed by Sulla after the Second Civil War. And these are the same guys. Pompey had been one of Sulla's lieutenants. These were the same senators who had supported Sulla are getting control of the Senate again. So when Caesar, if Caesar comes back to Rome, he knows they're probably at the minimum going to investigate him. If he's lucky, they'll only, you know, strip him of much of his property. If he's a little less lucky, they might actually banish him into exile. And they may even kill him. It's not as if he hadn't been on a death list before. And Caesar understands all this. Now, I'm not saying this justifies him doing what he did. But you have to put yourself in Caesar's, you know, shoes or sandals, I should say. If he comes back, He's going to be really vulnerable because he knows what's been going on in Rome. And he knows that with Crassus gone, Pompey and the faction have basically gotten control of Rome. Caesar is much more popular with it. Like I said, the lower middle classes, the tribute and the others. He was one of the popularities. So Caesar knows he's at risk. And he also knows, you have to remember, you know, we see it as a big deal. He's crossing the Rubicon. He's going to start a civil war, which he did. But you have to understand from Caesar's point, this is nothing new. During his lifetime, Sulla, who's, that's his faction in control of Rome again, had twice marched on Rome. Other commanders, Lepidus had once marched on Rome. He didn't get there. Sulla had gotten there twice. So what Caesar's doing marching on Rome while it violates the, the Roman constitution, if you want to put it that way, there's not that these are, there are actually written rules, but it's, it's not like it's never happened before. It's been done twice before. So a march on Rome, took power, established a temporary dictatorship, tried to restructure the Republic so it would be more stable, and then gave up power. And in all probability, that's Caesar's plan. So what, from his perspective, you know, what he had lived through and personally witnessed and participated in, this isn't as odd an attempt, an odd an event, as it looks to us looking backwards, only to the point that he crosses the Rubicon. You have to understand what he had lived through and put yourself in that perspective. He figures if he goes back to Rome, he may end up dead. So what does he do? He crosses the Rubicon, starts a civil war, wins a civil war, becomes dictator, dictator for life, 
and then is assassinated on the Ides of March by Brutus, who, uh, you know, did he say et tu Brute or you too Brutus, you son of a bitch? I mean, there's a lot of people think Brutus was actually his illegitimate son. We can't, nobody can prove that, nobody knows, and there's differences between historians, but it's not inconceivable. There were probably people at the time who thought uh, that Brutus was Caesar's illegitimate son. Caesar had a fairly intimate relationship with Brutus's mo mother at some point. Now, if you go back and you look at this, what are the lessons that we can draw from today? And there are several. The first is wealth. The things that were imbalancing the Republic was just the money, the riches pouring into Rome as the Republic expanded into becoming a you know, unnamed empire at the time. I mean, even before the Roman uh, Empire existed, it was an empire while they were still calling it a republic. I mean, they're, they're spread from Spain up to uh, the English Channel, all the way to the east, whole North African coast. It's an empire. Maybe it's run by a Republican form of government, but, you know, how long is that going to last? There's just too much money. Related to that is this idea of, you know, public service. Roman uh, officials were supposed to be serving the Republic. You know, SPQR, the Senatus Populusque Romana. You see it in all the movies with the, the legions where they're carrying their thing around. You know, the Senate and the people of Rome. That's where legitimacy lays. So you have, you know, Cincinnatus. You have other Roman, famous Romans who, who you know, risk their fortunes, their lives and all to save the Republic. What's happening in this period is that public service has gone to, morphed into public enrichment. You serve the public to enrich yourself, to enrich your family, to strengthen your family, to move up the social ladder. That's what Caesar's trying to do. He was of the elites, but he was relatively poor. Uh, and now he's trying to make himself very rich. And they're all doing this, and they're all taking money and, and enriching themselves, and they're all guilty of it. The other thing that you see happening, and this is a major trigger for, for Caesar to do what he does, is, is this idea, if you lose the political battle, you may lose your life, or you may end up in prison, or banished, or have your wealth destroyed. That's what's starting to happen. You see it again and again as these civil wars go on. It's not just a question anymore if, of, you know, if there's a political debate and I lose, okay, you know, I'll just go back to the farm, or I'll go back to my, my uh, house, or my home, or my mansion, or whatever you want to call it my estate. You know, if you fight a political battle and you lose, you may end up dead. Your family may be destroyed. So basically, people realize they're playing for keeps. And that's one of the major things confronting Caesar as he has to make his decision. It's not like he's going to go, come home, lose a political, in Rome, he's going to lose a political battle and then he'll have to, you know, retire. But they allowed Marius to do that. But it, and Saul did too. But if he comes, they may kill him. I mean, he's been on a death list once before from these same people, the Sola faction, the Optimates. And, and that's, I think, where we're getting in the United States today. If you look, there's so much wealth coming into the country. There's so much money to be made, international trade, international trade deals. In many ways, that's what the Biden scandal is all about. You can see that in both parties. I mean, Nancy Pelosi, just to you know, take an obvious example, I mean, she's made maybe on average in her 40-some years of service $200,000 a year. I mean, she's worth $120 million. How did that happen? And the Republicans are in the same boat. You know, they start off poor and they end up very rich. You know, Joe Biden, when he ran for president and he had you know, all those financial statements and all, he was worth under $100,000. According to some accounts, if you look at his, his debts and everything else, he was worth about 30 grand, which isn't a hell of a lot. Today, he's worth something like 12 to $15 million. You know, how does that happen? How does that happen? You can't say, well, you know, he made a quarter of a million dollars for eight years as vice president. You know, even if he saved every penny he made, what's that, two million bucks? You know, where's the rest come from? <laughs> really smart investments, sweetheart deals something else going on. And I think we're at that point today where there's so much wealth to be had and public service is seen less as a way to serve a public as it is to enrich yourself, enrich your family. 
I mean, look at the Clintons. Where, where were they? How did they start out? Look at the Obamas. I mean, some people come into politics already rich. You know, Trump was rich. The Bushes were rich. Al Gore was rich. The Kennedys were rich. In some ways, Lyndon Johnson was rich. But a lot of them aren't. But you never see any of them end up poor. That doesn't seem to be the pattern. And it's true of, of Republicans and Democrats. I don't mean to pick just on, you know, one group. I think there are more high-profile Democrats that you can point to because they're in the news, Joe Biden especially. At least I think I can talk about Joe Biden now, whereas if I talked about him eight weeks ago, it was unthinkable and, you know, the video might get taken down. But now it's okay. Uh, even the media is starting to talk about what went on with Hunter and his brother, uh, Joe's brother, not Hunter's brother. And, and I think that that's what you can see with the Roman Republic. This is a, it's a flush with money and it's causing corruption and political instability. This, the, the stakes are so much higher. It's not just, you know, do I win or lose? It's do I win and enrich my family or lose? And here's the other key point, maybe lose whatever my family already has. Because that's what happened in Rome. If you lost the political battle, you might end up, you know, the equivalent of today, having your family destroyed, your wealth destroyed, and end up in prison. Now, in Caesar's time, you may have ended up dead. We're not at that point yet. But you can see that, again, both ways. I mean, there were lots of people, not Trump himself, but others who talked about, you know, lock her up, you know, prosecute Hillary Clinton. Now, whether you say you can believe that she was guilty and should have been prosecuted or not really doesn't make a difference. If you're in power in this country and you lose an election and you face the possibility of trials and corruption and imprisonment and the destruction of your family and everything it has, that changes the political dynamic of win and lose. And the same thing's happening now with Trump. I mean, there are people on the left, not Joe Biden himself, but there are plenty of other people who want to see Trump, his sons, his daughters, his son and daughter-in-laws, all prosecuted. They want to see the Trump uh, corporation destroyed. They want to see Trump in prison. And that's the way it got with the Romans, where, you know, people had to start making political decisions, especially once they got power, if I give it up, what happens to me? And that's the problem, the dilemma that Julius Caesar faced at the Rubicon. I've been asked to give up power. I've been told to give up power. They're making me give up power. What are the costs of giving up power going to be to myself and my family and my relatives, my extended family? And the decision he made was, they're too high. I'll risk civil war before I do that. And at some point in this country, I'm not suggesting Donald Trump's going to, you know, cross the Rubicon tomorrow or throw dice on the ground and, you know, set off a civil war. But if we keep doing this, and we, I mean both sides, Republicans did the same thing with Hillary Clinton. If we keep doing this, where if you lose an election, you're going to head to jail, at some point, somebody's going to march on Rome. Somebody's going to march on D.C. Somebody's going to establish some sort of dictatorship, all in the name of restoring balance to the Republic. That's how it's going to happen. That's how it happened to the Romans. And we're going down that same path. You know, we're getting close. And you have to remember, when you look at Rome, it's not like nothing had happened before Caesar crossed the Rubicon. You had a half century of basically instability, structural instability, and civil war before the Republic fell. And that's the threat we face today because we're headed in the same direction. I don't know, you know, are we going to have a civil war? I've been posting videos about it. There's a playlist is here. Uh, I think it's becoming ever more danger. And I don't see anything going on with this election. No matter how it turns out, it doesn't really matter. The way the stakes are being shaped, the way instability is starting to shape up. We're headed down the same path. And that should be scary. And it should be something we talk about, but we don't. That's my take on, you know, Roman history and American contemporary politics and the dangers we face. Let me know what you think in a comment. 
you like the video, give it a thumbs up. You didn't, thumbs down. That's for it's you know it's all feedback. I'll take anything. Uh, hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Share the video with your friends. Subscribe to the channel. And until the next time, keep fighting.